I read somewhere that TED Talks began back in 84, I believe it was. And by all looks of it, this shag rug here has been around since then. <laughs> now, I'd like to take you back in time, but not that far back. Back to 1993. April of that year, to be exact. Bill Clinton had recently taken office as our nation's 42nd president. The Dallas Cowboys were the big winners at the Super Bowl that year. And me, I was 18 years old, preparing to graduate high school in a few weeks. Evenings and weekends, I worked part-time at a local Taco Bell restaurant. Just a few months earlier, I had purchased my first vehicle, a 1978 P Green Chevy Malibu Classic. As far as the teenage life went, I thought I was doing rather well. In fact, I thought I was doing so well, I convinced my parents to let me try living on my own for those last few weeks of high school. An older friend of mine had agreed to sublet his studio apartment to me for $265 a month. My parents had taught me well. I knew how to prepare my meals, wash my clothes, and manage my expenses. All I had to do was go to school and go to work and everything would be fine. And for a few weeks, everything was fine. Until I decided to party with some neighbors in an apartment nearby. Out on my own now, I was trying to socialize and fit in with the cool crowd. And then an apartment near mine was a sort of party house with guys and girls coming and going. Always a party going on. There'd be kids there playing cards, some drinking alcohol, and others were smoking marijuana. And when the marijuana joint was passed to me, I had a decision to make. Now, let me interject into this narrative for a moment and give you a description of my mindset at the age of 18. I was taught in school to just say no to drugs. And I was deadly afraid of hard drugs like crack and heroin. But with marijuana, I was admittedly a little more open. I mean, I had talked to others who had smoked it. I knew the reggae star, Bob Marley, he smoked it. Y'all hippies in the crowd, you guys survived, you smoked it, you did all right. Cheech and Chong even made a career out of smoking it. So I decided I was gonna to go to the library and do my own research and see what the books had to say. And my conclusion was trying it would be all right. I could try it a few times, do my own little experiment, quit at any time, no long-term side effects, and no one ever got hurt from smoking a joint, right? So a few nights out of the week, I went over to the party house to socialize, if you will. And one particular night when I was at the party house, some guys approached me about giving them a ride to get some marijuana. They introduced me to an equation that was never taught to me in school, in high school. We'll call it party house arithmetic. And it was something like this. I was the new guy and I had the P Green 1978 Chevy Malibu Classic. And since I had smoked with them, there was a sort of implicit obligation that I should give them a ride to get more marijuana. Now these guys were not my friends. They were older than me, more street savvy than I was, and a heck of a lot tougher. I didn't want to drive them anywhere. It was late at night. I had to go to school in the morning. And yet at that moment, saying no did not seem to be a wise option. They gave me some gas money and told me where to take them. The destination, Cocoa Beach. Sounded all right. So we got in the car and proceeded in that direction. Along A1A, we took a turn onto a long, sandy, windy road, which took us out towards the dealer's house and very close to the beach. They got out of the car and proceeded to the dealer's house, out of my sight. I had served my purpose. I had given them a ride. Now they were doing their drug deal, not me. I was scared to death already, out late at night on a drug deal, and now sitting in the car all alone. To calm my nerves, I remember focusing and listening to the sound of the waves as they crashed on the beach nearby. And as I listened to that soft, soothing sound, I heard it came from the direction of the house. It startled me. I didn't know what it was. I peered out into the darkness. I can't see anything. My senses are on high alert, but I told myself, just listen to the sound of the waves, relax. Everything's gonna be okay. As I listened to that soothing sound again, I heard 
again, from the direction of the house. It sounded like a gunshot. I'm really getting scared now. I don't know what's going on over there. And at that very moment is when the guys I dropped off came running towards my car, yelling, go, get out of here, start the car. I'm shaking, they're getting in the car. I try to turn the key and push on the gas. And as I do so, the engine floods. I had overflowed, I had flooded the engine. They're yelling at me again, go, get out of here, start the car. I steady my hand on the key and I push on the gas and the engine starts this time. Thoughts are racing through my mind. What just happened in there? Were those gunshots? Who was shooting at who? Why were they running? Fear is in total control. They said go and I headed out of there. Well, this is what I learned happened inside that house that night. Instead of paying for the pot, these guys decided to rip the dealer off. One of them pulled a gun on the dealer. And with that gun pointed at the ceiling, he pulled the trigger. That was that first shot I heard. But not only did they steal pot from the dealer, they decided to rob him for his wallet also. And upon exiting the house, one of them fired a single shot into the house. The second shot I heard. That bullet struck someone in the back of the head. It was a young man there just to visit his buddy. His life taken in an instant. And my life was forever changed. I was arrested for giving a ride to a drug deal, which became a robbery, which resulted in a homicide. My decision that night to give them a ride made me responsible under Florida's felony murder rule. And by the black letter of that law, the jury found me guilty. The judge sentenced me to spend the rest of my life in prison, a mandatory sentence with no discretion. So beginning at age 18, for the next three decades, my entire adult life was spent in a really bad place I did not like and could not leave. So the question tonight is what does a person do when he is stuck in a really bad place or situation that he cannot leave? We've all seen movies based on this premise. But this evening, I want to share with you a concept that I discovered, which helped me get through prison and could very well help you through any situation you might encounter. And I hope not. But should any one of you be so unfortunate to find yourself stuck in a jail or prison cell, what I'm about to share with you will definitely help you get through it. And here it is. For a limited time, and for the low price of 19 No, no, I didn't do it. I'm sorry. I'm not here to sell Tupperware this evening. Sorry to disappoint a few of you all. No. What this here is, is a visual representation of the concept I'd like to share with you this evening. Like these plastic bowls, plastic containers that stack one inside the other, everyone is living in a container within a container. At this very moment, we are all gathered here together in this room, this auditorium called the Oval Theater, which is a container. And this container exists inside the city of Tampa, another container. And the city of Tampa is one city in the state of Florida, thank you, another container. And Florida is one state in the country we call the United States of America, thank you, another container. And the United States of America is a country on the planet Earth, thank you, another container. And the planet Earth resides in the solar system, another container, thank you. And the solar system is what one planetary system in the galaxy known as the Milky Way galaxy. Thank you. Another container. And all of these containers exist inside the ultimate container, 
which we refer to as the universe. Now, we could subdivide this stack further. For instance, zip code, county, continent, hemisphere, orbit, group, supercluster. When you leave here this evening, you'll perhaps travel by car. So you would be in your car, a container, in Tampa, in Hillsborough, in Florida, etc. When you arrive home, you would exit your vehicle, but you would then enter your house or apartment, a container. So you'd be in your home, in Tampa, in Hillsborough, in Florida, etc. The point being, no matter where you are in life, you're within some level of container. And there is no escaping this. That realization right there put my incarceration in a totally different perspective. It made it almost irrelevant. I realized that the cell, the jail, the prison that I was in was just another container that I had to live within. And if I can live within all of these other containers already in my life, I can live within this one too. That was for me a true paradigm shift. If I could not change the location or the situation that I was in, I could change the way I looked at it. And I chose to no longer focus on the container at all, but instead focus on what type of life I wanted to live within that container. Now at times in life, we all find ourselves stuck in situations, locations, containers that we don't want to be in. It doesn't have to be a jail or a prison like I was in. For example, during this COVID pandemic, many of you might have been stuck at home, a container you love and yet wished you could have been anywhere else. At such times, what we do is we find a way to make the best of whatever situation we are in until that situation should improve. So there I was in a really bad container full of some really bad dudes who did some really bad things. And I decided, you know what? It's going to be my goal and my objective in life to live my best life in spite of my container, to enjoy the life I have, to remain positive, and to not in any way become a part of the system that I was in. Now, obviously, because I was in prison, many things in life simply were not available to me. My choices and options were severely limited. So what I had to do instead was focus on what I did have and not what was missing. When I found good books to read, I read as many as I could. When I was given opportunities to exercise, I jogged and worked out. When I had access to a computer, I applied myself and learned all I could. Whenever an opportunity to enrich my life became available to me, I seized it. All of the negative influences inside of that container, which could have taken my life in another direction, I avoided them completely. All the while, what I was doing was training myself, training my mind to focus only on what was good, on what I was grateful for, and all the things I did have inside of that container. As a result, I became more and more optimistic in my thinking. I truly began to embrace the belief that my cup was half full and not half empty. You know, I would have never, ever have attained a goal of living my best life inside of that container by focusing on what was wrong, what was missing, or what I didn't have inside of that container. In fact, I probably would have never made it out of that container thinking like that. But today I stand here before you on the TEDx stage before this wonderful audience to let you know that I did it. I made the best of my life within that container. And my endeavor was noted by Florida's parole board. On March 30th of this year, just a few months ago, I was released on parole after nearly three decades in prison. Although my sentence was life, they decided to grant me parole. 
They saw something in me which gave them confidence to give me a second chance at freedom. And what they saw is this. I figured out that the container does not matter. No matter where I am in life, I can choose to live a good and a positive life. And now you can too. Thank you.